This component you see here is called a ferrite bit. It is one of those components that isn't very famous. A lot of people don't even know about it. Usually people discover this component only after working in electronics for years and then they realize they really need it. In this video, beside ferrite beads, we are going to check out two other electronic components. If you want to reach a high level of skills in electronics, whether you are into repairing boards or designing them, you need to fully understand electronic components. So stay with me for these few minutes and let's get completely familiar with these three interesting components. Hello my dear friend, welcome to a new episode of Basic Component Series. In the previous five episodes we learned a total of 33 basic components and now in this episode 6 we are going to add 3 more to our list making it 36 components in total and furthermore in the next episodes of the same series we will continue learning more components so that eventually we can reach a very strong skill level in electronics. All right. Let's not waste time and jump into the first component, component number one, ferrite beads. A ferrite bead is an electronic component used to reduce or eliminate high frequency noises. Ferrite is the name of the metal alloy used inside to build it, basically an iron based alloy. These tiny components you see here are called ferrite beads and they are used to eliminate high frequency noises. They don't have a specific appearance, they just have two leads like a resistor or more like a diode but without that silver strip that uh, diodes normally have. Look. This is a diode, for example. It has its specs printed on it, and you can see the silver strip here that shows the polarity. I mean, the, it shows or it tells you which side of the diode is positive side and which side is the negative side of the diode. We already talked about diodes and their types and their applications in earlier episodes, so I won't repeat that here. Now, notice that ferrite beads usually don't have anything written on them. They just uh, look like a dark little piece on a wire like this. The ferrite bead doesn't look special, right? But what it does is really cool. If I want to explain its function in one sentence, a ferrite bead acts like a normal wire at low frequencies, but at high frequencies, it acts like a big resistor. And when I say high frequencies, I don't mean 10 kilohertz or 100 kilohertz or even one megahertz. I mean frequencies above dozens of megahertz. This is a schematic symbol of a ferrite bead. Ferrite beads are bidirectional components like resistors. I mean, there is no difference between their leads. They are not just like uh, diodes which have anode or cathode pins. There is no difference between leads of a ferrite bead. Anyway, uh, here I want to use my function generator to produce signals at different frequencies and apply the frequency to one lead of the ferrite bead and see what happens on the opposite lead and test the uh, ferrite bead's effect. I am connecting the oscilloscope pressure to both ends of the fright bit so we can see if the input and output signals change. I'm going to set up this circuit. The yellow signal is the input and the blue signal is the output. At low frequencies, the input and outputs are the same. But when we increase the frequency, you see the output gets weaker. Look. Thank you. 
this function generator can go up to 60 megahertz and at the 60 megahertz frequency you can see that the output gets much lower compared to the input you might be asking why did the input signal also dropped in amplitude it shouldn't weaken and you are absolutely right the input shouldn't lose amplitude but this has nothing to do with the ferrite bit it is actually a limitation of my function generator it can't maintain the same amplitude at very high frequencies to see the ferrite bits effect even better we would need to go beyond 100 megahertz but my function generator maxes out at 60 megahertz still even here we can clearly the effect higher frequency equals to lower output amplitude remember free bits are not magicians they just reduce the amplitude of high frequency signal and their effect increases as the frequency increases but even at 60 megahertz we can clearly see the drop if we place several fret beats in series we can increase the effect i'm going to test it here i have put five fret beats in series now you can see that the output signal is much more weakened compared to that of single fret beats so yes multiple fret beats in series increase the effect a key point for effective ferret beat use place it as close as possible to the noise source and design the PCB traces connecting it very short. Anyway, that's enough to introduce ferrite beats. If you want a full dedicated video on them, tell me in the comment section. Now, let's move on to the next component, component number two, speakers. This component is a speaker. A lot of people think that it's super simple, but that's not true. I told you before that I loved electronics since I was like five or six years old. Back then, I thought that if I just apply voltage across a speaker, it would make sound like what i am doing right now applying voltage to speaker terminals you hear that tick tick sound be careful don't do this for too long or with high voltage because you will damage the speaker when i was a kid and my dad repaired electronics i ruined several of his speakers like this We already talked about microphones in previous episodes, so I won't repeat everything, but I'll build this simple microphone circuit just to show you something. One, two, three, I'm testing. When we speak, the diaphragm in our throat produces vibrations like this waveform you see on the oscilloscope. If we could reproduce the same waveform on the speaker's terminal, we would get my exact voice out of the speaker. One, two, three. Generating a proper sound signal electronically is not easy. You need an amplifier circuit. I've already made a full amplifier project video with all the details and I won't repeat it here. I'll put the link in the description in the case you want to watch it. Making meaningful sound like this one is hard, but producing a simple periodic signal like this is easy. Using a 555 timer, we can create a simple square wave and make beeping sound out of the speaker to test the speaker. This tiny 8 pin IC is a 555 timer IC, super popular and versatile. One of its simplest use is to generate a square wave pulses. I added a variable resistor here so we can change the frequency. Let's build this circuit to see what happens. When I power the circuit, the speaker beeps, and when I adjust the potentiometer, the beep frequency changes. 
changing the beep tone means changing frequency how close or far apart those pulses are so when i decrease the variable resistor value the frequency increases and the sound become higher pitched and when i increase the resistor frequency goes down and the sound becomes bassier so we learned how to use a speaker now you might ask how a speaker actually creates sounds to really get it we need to understand what sound is a speaker is basically a coal here a permanent magnet and a diaphragm sound is just vibration of air molecules when we apply a voltage or signal to speaker terminals the coil here becomes an electromagnet and depending on the polarity of the voltage get pulled toward or pushed away from the permanent magnet these tiny and fast movements shakes the diaphragm which shakes air molecules and that vibration travels through the air to our ears that is sound that covers the basics of speakers but before moving on let me destroy a few common misunderstandings first many people think that speakers behave like resistors linear they do not for example this speaker says 8 ohms right look here people think that it means it always has 8 ohms resistance wrong a speaker has impedance and it changes depending on the signal conditions. Another misconception. People think a speaker radiates sound equally in all directions like a sphere. Not true. Some directions project more sound energy than others. And another funny one. People think a bigger speaker automatically means much louder sound. Look here, this small amplifier can drive a small speaker like this one. Some people think that if they replace this speaker with a huge one, it will suddenly produce a massive loud sound. Now, a big speaker requires a more powerful amplifier. If that were true, we could power a giant stadium speaker system with a tiny amplifier like this. Imagine that. Anyway, that's enough for speakers. Now, let's go to the component many people think they understand, but actually they don't. Looks simple, but it is secretly complicated. Component number three, batteries. Batteries are another component used in electronic devices. Technically, a battery is a type of voltage source, but it is not the same as an ideal voltage source. This is a schematic symbol for a battery and this is a voltage source. To simplify, a battery is a non-ideal voltage source. A voltage source is defined as something that provides a constant voltage at its terminal no matter how much current is drawn, even infinite current, theoretically. But the voltage source only exists as a concept, not in a real life. In the real world, what we have are batteries and they behave almost like a voltage source. Look. Here is a common AAA battery. It provides energy for circuits. For example, if I connect this motor to the battery, the motor runs. Look. See? It is spinning. A battery, like a voltage source, tries to maintain a fixed voltage, but it can't do that perfectly. When we draw current from a battery, its voltage drops. How much it drops? It depends on current amount we are drawing and battery's quality and capacity. Here is a rechargeable lithium battery. Right now, the voltage across the battery is about 4 volts. If I connect a load like this resistor, a 47 Oh, resistor it will start drawing current and the battery voltage will drop the resistor is drawing current right now and you can see the voltage across the battery is dropped to 3.865 volts now let's connect a bigger load to draw more current for example I'm going to connect this 22 ohm resistor instead of this 47 ohm resistor. See, the voltage dropped even more. And if I keep the load connected, the voltage will continue to decrease over time. 
Batteries come in many types. One major classification is rechargeable versus non-rechargeable batteries. AA, AAA, and coin cell batteries are usually disposable, while others are rechargeable and can be used many times. These are rechargeable lithium batteries. Lithium batteries have subtypes like lithium ion, lithium phosphate, lithium polymer, but in this video, we won't get into these types. Also, there are other rechargeable battery types like silt lead acid batteries or others which are not the subject of this video as well each battery type has its own characteristics pros and cons and can be used in its right place anyway to charge a battery you must apply a voltage higher than its nominal voltage for example many lithium batteries rated 3.7 volt charge at 4.2 volts different batteries have different charging voltages and charging current each one must be checked separately Anyway, there is a lot to learn about batteries, but we don't have enough time for everything here. However, I have to explain an important one. One very important parameter is capacity. Battery capacity is printed on the battery. For example, here we have 2000 milliampere hours. The unit is milliampere hour, not just milliamperes. The number written here means if we draw 2000 milliamperes from this battery, the battery will last for 1 hour. If we draw 200 milliamperes from this battery, the battery will last for 10 hours. If we draw 100 milliamperes from this battery, the battery will last for 20 hours. And if we draw 50 milliamperes, the battery will last for 40 hours. Batteries seem simple, but honestly, they are one of the most complicated components. You need knowledge and experience to use them properly in your circuits. Anyway, thanks for staying with me until the end of this video. If this video was helpful, please give it a thumbs up. And if you are interested in microcontrollers, programming, and electronics, subscribe to my channel and wait for future videos. Until the next video, take care of yourself and have a great one. See you in the next video.